for me, it's like the music of the voice. What does the voice sound like? And um, musically. But there also comes a time when you have to kind of let that go and trust that you're there or or close enough or, you know, in the ballpark that it's going to be there. And then now you have to make choices for the character, for the sake of the character, rather than letting it languish by being in imitation. Puppeteers Podcast presents Cheers to Puppeteers, a special fundraiser to benefit the direct relief fund for puppet artists, helping puppeteers of America impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have nine very special episodes featuring some of puppetry's brightest stars. You can support this effort by unlocking episodes early, purchasing Cheers to Puppeteers swag, or making a donation to the Direct Relief Fund, all at puppeteers.com slash cheers. Let's lend a hand and say cheers to puppeteers. We now return to your previously scheduled podcast. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity. And today we have on the show Matt Vogel. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for having me. Hello, Cameron. Hello. Well, uh, it is so delightful to have you here today on the show. For anybody who doesn't know, um, this must be your first time ever listening to Puppeteers, because we have today uh, the performer behind some of the most iconic Muppet characters, um, the Kermit the Frog, Big Bird, Count Von Count, of course, uh, also Constantine and Uncle Deadly and so many more. Um, Matt Vogel, welcome to Puppeteers, and thank you for helping us um, support the P of A with our Cheers to Puppeteers series. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to do this. It'll be fun. Yeah. Good. Let's jump right into it. I was wondering, what, sure. what projects are you working on right now? What we are working on right now is we are on the Sesame Street side of things. We are working on gearing up to start shooting season 52. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, rules and regulations that have now come into play because of the pandemic. And so we're having to make adjustments to, to our, the way that we normally work. Yeah. And uh, so it's a slow process, uh, but it's a necessary process. And, uh, you know, we hope to be up and running, I mean, I hope sometime in the new year. So I imagine, so obviously it's changed the process in filming and whatnot, but I imagine it's also changed the curriculum to some extent, too. Has that changed much at all? The curriculum hasn't really changed, uh, although we have shot two specials now that are related to the pandemic. Uh, they're both Elmo's. One was an Elmo's Playdate special, and then the other one that was called Elmo's Scavenger Hunt, Playdate Scavenger Hunt. Uh, and I got to direct both of those. And what was interesting about them is that we shot them over, we shot them via Zoom. Uh, we, we uh, the performers were at home. They had their cameras, which that was their phone, and they would shoot themselves on, on their cameras while we watched in on Zoom. And then uh, they would send their files up to our editor. The editor would put them all together. And uh, that's kind of how we've done that now for, we did that for two specials. And, um, you know, it's kind of an, an odd way of working, working at home kind of in a vacuum, not really having your fellow performer to bounce off of. It's, it's a little difficult because, you know, timing is, is so essential in our job. And on Zoom, uh, even if there is a scene with two characters performing, uh, the timing is just a little bit off. So we have to try to tighten it up in, in the so edit. so when there was multiple characters you didn't just uh direct them individually and then edit together you actually worked with multiple people in different locations at the same time yes it depends it depended on the scene but yes we would so we would have uh in the last special we did we had a scene where we had uh gonger who is uh warwick bronlow pike who uh, lives in london he lives in the uk david rudman who lives in chicago uh Leslie Carr Rudolph, who lives in uh, New York, and uh, and Ryan Dillon as Elmo, who also lives in New York City, and we had all of those guys on a call at the same time. Everybody was shooting from their individual locations, and we shot material with them in an in an effort to try to help the timing 
of, of the scenes be as close as it could be, or at least we could hear what the reactions of the of the lines and the performances were going to be, so we knew how to then react. Because so much of what we do is listening to what our fellow performer has to say and then reacting based upon, you know, how, right. what Easy, we're receiving. Easier to accommodate a small time lapse versus, uh, you know, completely, you know, imagining what the other person is going to say yeah. and trying to react to, to that. That's true. That is true. And, and there have been times when, and there were times when we have, we have to do that and you kind of imagine what the person's saying. Uh, but in general, we do try to, we want to act with our acting partners as much as possible. Yeah, yeah of course. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, and before we get too far into it too, I want to, you know, the other thing that, uh, that I know you're working on right now is that you've just launched your, your podcast below the frame. That's right. Yeah, we, we've uh, launched a podcast I've been working on. It was kind of my pandemic project, sort of, but I, I, it, at least it allowed me to have really a significant amount of time to, to get ahead and start putting, start putting it together and, mm-hmm. uh, and to think about how, what, what I wanted to do. And what I, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to make it feel like when you're listening to it, you're listening to just me and whoever I'm talking to, and it's like we're in the same room together and just having a conversation. It's an in-depth conversation. It's an interview with a, a Muppet performer or somebody in the Muppet universe. It could be a writer. It could be a wrangler. It could be a director. It could be, I don't know. I don't know who. It could be anybody, you know? And um, and I, th- I think it's going to be... I think it's really what it in, ends up being is a great little time capsule uh, um, about these performers and their lives and how they got to be on Sesame Street or with the Muppets or, or doing whatever they're doing. So I, I love that. I love sitting and talking and learning about what my fr- how my friends got to be where they are. And um, we also do some fake ads for things that you might need if you want to be a puppeteer, because we're aware that a lot of people who probably listen to that podcast might aspire to be doing what we're doing. So we kind of made, made these fake ads. And, uh, and then I talk a little bit about what that subject is that in, in, in reality, <laughs> rather than a ridiculous you know, commercial for arm rods. Uh, then I talk about arm rods and how important it is and, you know, what you sh- maybe should or shouldn't try to do when you're first starting out as a puppeteer. And then there's another segment in it that we do every few episodes that it, that focuses on Jerry Nelson, who is one of my friends and mentors. And we are able to talk about him. Um, I ask him up a performer to to give me a memory of Jerry or some recollection that they have of him. And then... Um, after Jerry died, Jerry's wife, Jan, gave me this digital folder of material that Jerry had written over the years, uh, you know, in the 2000s, some, sometime in there. And it was basically like an autobiography of, of his. And uh, But he'd never, I wish that he had recorded them with, with his voice. It would have been so beautiful to hear him saying these stories. But we've got the writings, and Jan was very supportive and said, I'd really love, I'd love for people to get to know Jerry a little bit better. You know, there's not a lot, really a lot out there about Jerry. And, um, and this really shows, it does talk about, he talks about Sesame Street and he talks about the Muppets in it, but it really is about his life outside of those, uh, outside of those circles and experiences that he had in the fifties and sixties. And even into the 70s. Uh, and it's it's really cool. So I've asked some Muppet performers to read those stories. And uh, then I've got some music of Jerry's that hasn't really been heard. There are demos for songs that then became part of his album, Truro Daydreams. Um, and so I, I'm going to share, I've been able to share those songs as well. So it kind of lets people who don't really know who Jerry is or was kind of lets them know who, who he was and what kind of person he was. And for those people that did know who Jerry was, it, it's just like a nice, big, uh, warm embrace for, yeah. for his memory. Yeah, no, that's, that's so wonderful. We, um, 
uh, we're good friends with Chase Wolner, uh, who I'm, I'm sure you know, and mm -hmm. um, he kind of got to know Jerry um, in some of the last last his last years. And um, what I know, I remember Chase sharing with with me and Adam at one point was how um, Jerry didn't quite know or appreciate that he was recognized by fans, and it wasn't until the internet kind of came along and there was, you know, the live Muppet festival and, and the forums and things like that, where all of a sudden people real, like he realized that people like truly knew and recognized who he was. Um, and I, I yeah. think, um, people like him and Richard Hunt, while there are certainly people in the, the fan community who, who know them, um, I think it's really wonderful that you're able to kind of show him to potentially a new audience who've maybe read about Carol has obviously read a lot about Jim, but, um, yeah. you know, get this other side. I think so too. And, you know, Jerry was pretty, he was a pretty private person. And in fact, I think, I think this is a story I heard about when he moved up to the Cape and for years, he, he just was up at the Cape doing, doing his thing, playing music and getting to know people and, Never once did he really bring up that he worked on Sesame Street or that he played the Count or was, you know, a Muppet performer. And when people learned that, they were like, what? what? Why didn't you tell us? And he's like, eh, you know, I do other things, too. Wow. He was on Farmville, of all things. Um, I'm not if I'm maybe dating myself, but there was a, a Facebook game for a while. It was like a strange virtual reality thing. And I'll never forget getting a Facebook request from him <laughs> to become his friend and like share time on his virtual farm growing, you know, corn stalks and apple plants and all sorts yeah. of that sounds crazy very things. much like Jerry. When uh <laughs> we used to at Kaufman a story where we shoot Sesame Street, we used to be in a big big soundstage, the biggest one there, I think. And our Muppet room was on that floor. And Jerry oftentimes, most of the time, if he wasn't doing the crossword, he was in the Muppet room and he had a uh, Nintendo set up and he would play Tetris and he would just be playing Tetris. <laughs> oh my God. And that's he was amazing. really good at it too. So he loved his games. He did love those games. And, that's uh, amazing. So that's wow. So with I this podcast, that. I know, I know obviously you're the host of it and then you, uh, um, and you've, it seems like it was kind of your idea for a lot of this stuff. Is it technically produced through Sesame Street or anything? Is, do you have your own production company, or is it something you just kind of... It's entirely self-produced by yeah. me, and me calling my friends and saying, would you come and talk to me on this podcast? <laughs> or, you know, asking Peter Lins, hey, do you mind recording something uh, about, uh, about lip sync for me, please, so I can put it into the podcast? And, you know, everybody's really yeah. great about about playing along. You know, we did it first as this Facebook live show. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I think starting in 2016, 2017, when we were shooting Sesame Street and we did it for three seasons, we did like, I think six episodes, the first season, maybe sec two, maybe six, the second season, and then like one, the third season, there just was no time. And it was a lot of fun to do. It was so much fun. We did it live during our lunch break, which, uh, it, it, it brought up a couple of diff little difficulties. You know, sometimes during lunch break, you got to do pre-records for what you're going to do the afternoon, or you've got to do an interview, or you just want to eat your lunch and just have quiet time. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it made it very difficult to kind of continue doing that. But when we were doing it, and it, everybody wanted to come and sit in the Muppet room when we did it. We had people from the crew come in and sit there and, you know, Peter Linz would do his version of, of below the, below the frame oh, where yeah, he would right. do a live <laughs> version of the behind the scenes of the show that was behind the scenes of Sesame street. So, and that, that version of it was approved by Sesame workshop and, and they, and both Sesame workshop and the Muppet studio have been very supportive about, this podcast version of Below the Frame as well. But, uh, you know, we just couldn't, I couldn't do it any more like that. It, it was fun, but this is a little bit easier for me to kind of control it yeah. and to, yeah. to do it when I can do it. Yeah, and, I imagine you don't feel as rushed. You only have so much limited time. You're not interrupting people. It's planned out a little bit more. People yes. can sit back, relax, and really get into a deep conversation, which is what I've noticed about them so far and what I've really enjoyed about them. 
Yeah, well, thanks. That, that is really what it, I was trying to think of. Like, well, how? What's my angle here? What am I going to try to get out of these people that I've known? Some of some of whom I've known for twenty five years, you know. And how? You know, I I know them, but do I know everything about them? And you know, I next the uh, episode four is with Jennifer Barnhart. And okay. at the end of that episode, she's like, this is the longest conversation we've ever had, like oh, nonstop yes. conversation. <laughs> and it's true because, you know, we, we have little moments with people throughout time and hours of the day. But to really just sit and get to know somebody over a couple of hours and, and hear their story, you don't always get the opportunity to do that. And I thought it would be fun and unique to do that with with these people that are some of whom are legends in in this profession and um i'm I'm just excited to have been able to to do that to 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 share that with people that care to listen to it (laughs) well yeah and uh we're we're certainly very you know appreciative that you guys are are taking the time because i think um you know there for so long, there was some really great behind the scenes content that was officially like produced. You know, and this is me talking like 70s, 80s. Um, mm-hmm. And so to have this new, you know, fresh for the time version of peaking um, below the frame, I was going to say below the curtain or behind the curtain. But um, yeah, it's um, it's it's been really great. Um, we'd, we'd love to go back um, to sort of how all this stuff got started for you um and you know even to a time maybe before puppetry of just like what what kind of kid were you um you know precocious i mean now we're we of course see you as this like wonderful overachiever but has it has it always been this way (laughs) well you know i was always interested in art and drawing and uh you know when i was in first and second grade and then around third grade uh I began to be very interested in the Muppet Show, and uh, and and I'd always been interested in Sesame Street, but I'm a first generation Sesame Street watcher and learner, and now and then a first generation Muppet Show viewer as well. And once puppets came around for me, I, I was I was so enthralled by them, and I wanted to I wanted to make them, but I didn't want to. <laughs> I just wanted to have them done. I wanted, I didn't want to, making them was not my forte, nor mm-hmm. did I have the patience to do it. Uh, but, but I made my own puppets as a kid, as a third, third grade kid and, and entertained kids in the neighborhood. And, and I, a lot of kind of creative play that way, uh, acting, uh, imagination. That's the kind of kid that I was so much so that at a certain point, I was just thinking about this the other day, I would write scripts, not really scripts, just kind of like, here's, here's what's going to happen. Do you remember the show? There was a show called V. It was an mm-hmm. alien show that was on, <laughs> that was a mini series. I don't know that I've ever heard of that. And no. it's, I think it's in the early eighties or sometime in there. Uh, there. So, I, and I think that's the show that I was thinking of, but I would kind of get the kids in the neighborhood to play that with me but to follow the little script that i had written that was just made up and you know like you know my brother played along and i'm like and your character dies but you come back as this other character and this is just something that i did for fun and we would kind of play out this script uh that i had written you know in episodes and that's tomorrow and that we'll do this tomorrow tomorrow's episode will you'll see what happens you know and so i was kind of writing a little bit and then being in these planned out scripted play times were these recorded or these were just no (laughs) okay (laughs) darn (laughs) no it was literally just us playing you know pretending uh like we were in that that world but but there's never more pressure on on you as a as a thespian than when you're in the backyard with a bunch of kids your age and you're trying to direct them like you're you know that's true lucy in a that's true or when somebody's like i don't want to be the one that dies now why do i have to be the bad guy well that's just what i wrote sorry (laughs) yeah i died last week killing my character (laughs) off so but that's the kind of thing that i did and then i was also writing uh puppet scripts for my puppet shows and uh 
And I, I wasn't, I, I'm kind of a shy kid, I would say, unless I'm around people that I'm comfortable with. And then if I'm around people that I'm comfortable with, I'm a little bit more outspoken and um, obnoxious, probably. Um, but yeah. as And then kid, this was, this was uh, like middle school age you're talking now? I think we're getting into middle school age, yeah, yeah. sometime in there. We called it junior high. Back then, <laughs> that's what it was back then. But yeah, Depends I would the say school. middle school. Yeah, uh, middle school, junior high, uh, that age. And then, um, and I've talked about this before, but I'll talk about it here anyway. I, I was doing puppet shows for PTAs and for church and for just kids in the neighborhood. My dad had built me a stage, which was awesome. He bought a, a, a PA system and we had these giant microphones that we would wear around our necks like huge they were lav mics but they were about they were gigantic they were like yeah. four inches and maybe a, an inch and a half around and we would wear them around our necks and we would do uh puppet shows and then in uh the ninth grade i entered the the talent show at our at our junior high and um i had a couple friends help me do this puppet show uh my dad had built me a brand new stage. And uh, at the end of that talent show, I won. But I, uh, and I was so happy. I mean, it was really cool to win the talent show in your school. But at the end of that talent show, uh, I could hear boo. I could hear booing. And it wasn't like overwhelming. It wasn't like, yeah, boo, get him up. But I, I could hear that. And I think, you know, What's common is that we always hold on to those negative things that we hear mm -hmm. so much more than we hold on to the positive things. It's just mm -hmm. kind of a human part of us. So that's what I heard. I heard the booing and um, and I put the puppets away and I, I just put them. I didn't take them to school anymore. And uh, that was it for puppets until, you know, until a little bit later on. But. What I did do was I decided to, well, I didn't decide. My mom knew that I needed some sort of creative outlet. And uh, so she signed me up for an acting class at a place called Theater for Young America. I come from Kansas City, so uh, there's this place called Theater for Young America in Kansas City, and it's still there. And they're still teaching uh, young actors, and they do live professional shows, and they bus kids in, and they show them the shows. And I was part of that. I became part of that group of kids that were learning at this theater and then also a kid that was part of the shows that that, that they were uh, doing every once in a while like a christmas show or summertime shows i was a part of and that led me to go to college to be an actor uh, because i do feel like you know as a puppeteer being an actor is an essential part of it it oh, really is time. at least the kind of puppeteering that i do the, the muppet performing performance part of it it you need to be an actor uh, I wasn't thinking that I wasn't thinking oh, I'm going to be an actor so then then I can be a puppeteer I was thinking yeah. I'm going to be go be an actor now um, and that's what I tried to do so I, I went to college to be an actor did you did you do the shows in high school like the musicals I did. and the plays what uh, did yeah. you, did you have any uh, favorite roles that you did back then uh, I played Cornelius in Hello Dolly oh nice uh, I played, um, what were the other shows that we did? I played, um, Perchick, is that it? In, um, Fiddler on the Roof, uh, who was like the young, the Ru uh, Russian rebel, the rebel guy that comes in. Right. With the, causes a rebellion, I believe, yes. or tries to cause a rebellion. I we're and, talking to Marty Robinson. He played Fagin when he was in high school. Yes, I know. He's such a Fagin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, he's perfect. Yeah, and so I did, got to do shows like that, and um, I did that, and then and then transitioned to this uh, children's theater, and then into yeah, college. That's so interesting because you know we were just talking to Fran Brill, and that's when we were talking a lot about the acting because uh, you know Cam brought it up in the other episode that there wasn't a lot of. Um, of the other puppeteers that necessarily had an acting background too, so you know, d coming to you know the puppetry world, did you feel like that was a, a great asset that you had? Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, it, it it's it's a piece of the puzzle that you have to have. I mean, there are so many, especially in television puppetry, 
I mean, all, all forms of puppetry for sure, but in television puppetry, you have to have a bunch of different tools in your toolbox. And one of those is the acting tool. And the other is the, you know, no one had a lip sync and no one had to work on a monitor and no one had to do eye focus and share the frame. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Find your light and, and be a good person. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, those, those are things. essential yeah. as well. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. Very, very important when we're looking for new talent. That's one of the things when we're doing workshops, we, 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 we watch and we observe to see what kind of person you are and how you how you interact with the other people at the workshop. That's important to me. You let Austin Costello slip in though, so we gotta, we'll talk <laughs> yes, about that after. Yeah. I know, I know. He, he's I don't know probably one of happened. my best friends in the puppet world. I don't know. So. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. No, Austin's a great guy. He's, oh, he's, yeah. he's there's really always great. a few in every family. Yeah. <laughs> I know, and you know that's the thing now is, and Austin is part of our mentorship program, Sesame mm -hmm. Workshop. Uh, part of our mission is to grow uh, a diverse bench of uh, upcoming future talent. Yeah. And so we have, I think, eight mentees now. And they come from all different parts of the country, actually. Uh, not all of them live in the New York area, in the tri-state area anyway. And they're all very talented. And, you know, they're all young, younger talent that, that, or at least in this field that, that need work in this field and have shown a lot of promise to us. And they've most all of them, uh, I think all, all of them, but one has been to our puppet workshops, at least one puppet workshop that we have at Sesame Workshop. And, um, you know, we're just kind of looking at them, trying to help foster them and foster their growth in this profession. That's yeah. great. No, it's and it's, and it's Austin so is one of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he's gonna kill me after he hears this. <laughs> uh, no, but that but that's so important, and I think um, you know uh, it's this is something Adam and I talk about all the time. Is that you know you could you could perform in your in your bedroom with a little handy camera or whatever as much as you can, but until you're working with other people. That's that's a you know one of those legs that you need to be able to stand on, and I think it's really um, it it's, it speaks to the mission of what you guys do that you would allow that that space for people to try and fail and and get better at their skills in a in that safe environment. Yeah, I think you're I think you're right, and you are working in a vacuum if you're just sitting at home because you have no idea that you know when you're working at home you want to set you set the camera up in the optimal position for you to perform. It's the monitors right in front of you. But when you're working on a show, in reality, the camera might be way over there. Your monitor might be over there. There might be an obstacle in your way or the camera might be moving. How are you going to deal with those things? It's you're really, sewn into it's really a couch. Like, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Who knows? You know, and on Sesame Street, we, we are a three camera live switching show. So... That means that not only is there that main camera angle that you see and you're like, okay, I'm good at that. Now we switch to another camera and it's over here and you have to, there are subtle puppetry moves that you have to, you have to make an adjustment. You know, it only looks good on this shot mm -hmm. and you have to then make it very quickly look good on this shot and then that shot, mm -hmm. you know, and that takes time to really bake into your brain. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so uh, how th this is a good transition then from, you know, you're, you're doing this acting as a high school and, and college student. Uh, I know that there's the sort of fateful story of you finding your way to the Coca-Cola bear. Um, but where where were you able to really get that boots on the ground training of learning the monitor work and kind of building up that experience for you to get to the place, um, you know, where you felt comfortable on set? For me, some of that was uh, some of that was on the job training, to be honest, on Sesame Street early on. Uh, and being a right hand is a great way to try to get your mind around the monitor. But I also worked, uh, did a couple workshops, but then I also um, was Tyler Bunch uh, had some of us over in his apartment on the Upper West Side. And we would do little monitor nights. And, and I still hear about people doing monitor nights in the city and people getting together to do these monitor nights and get together and try to work on their skills and 
and have a good time and you know I'm all for it I feel like it's a great way to to hone your craft it's a great way to find out how you work well with people or if you work well with people and how you work or should work with people so I encourage those you know monitor nights and and things like that it was part of what I had at my uh, fingertips when I was coming up. And then uh, the other part of it was really was on the job training. So the way I understand it, your sort of first audition f- with Sesame in a, in a formal way was uh, for, to, to be Carol's understudy. Is that correct? That's right. You know, I had, I, I think I had done maybe the Thanksgiving Day Parade I think maybe I'd done that. And I'd, of course, done the, the Coca-Cola polar bear with John Henson. But I, I don't remember if I'd really done anything else on the actual street. I never met Carol before that day. I, although I do remember, and this just popped back into my head, I do remember there's a theater in New York called the, it's the New Amsterdam Theater. And it's uh, on 42nd Street, and they were holding a fundraiser. And I was the eyes. Uh, I got to come and do the eyes of Sweetums for, oh, for okay. John, I think. Oh, cool. And, but at that evening, Big Bird was also there. And I remember watching Big Bird from the audience. And, and it's the same feeling I had when I was a kid and went to the Ice Follies, the Sesame Street Ice Follies, and saw Big Bird there. And Big Bird kind of came over to the edge of the the uh, the rink and and looked out and waved. And he really it looked like he was looking right at me and waving to me. Well, I had that same feeling as an adult <laughs> in, at the new at the new uh, New Amsterdam Theater. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I could just pause for a second because something yeah. that I've I've realized um, when th- any of the three of us were growing up, the way that um, televisions would turn RGB, the red, blue, and green uh, tubes into the Big Bird yellow, like muddied that color. So when you would actually see him in real life, it was such a much more vibrant yellow. Oh, I mean, vibrant. still to today, Very but so. it, you know, it was almost like a green or a brown, depending on your yeah. television set. So to see it in person really does like it, it wakes you up. It is amazing. He's a beautiful character. And to see him looking at me from the stage of this Broadway house, and I hadn't met Carol, was pretty pretty amazing. And then flash forward to meeting him, and, you know, I of course knew who Carol Spinney was, and but I had never, ever in my life, ever, until they called me and said, can you do a Big Bird voice? I'd never thought about I'm going to do Big Bird someday. You know, none of us, I don't think there's any of us that do what we do that have ever really thought, I'm going to do that one day. You know, that have thought, I'm going to take over that character. (laughs) It's not really the way it works, but meeting him and spending time with him and uh, was just amazing for me. You know, it was it was great. He Carol was a great guy. You know, he was at the time he was about 65. So we don't have understudies. That's not really a thing that we do. It's one person does the the character and that's it. And that keeps it authentic. It keeps it the integrity of the character. It keeps it as strong as it can be. Um, And so we don't really have understudies. But Carol was 65. (laughs) And, you know, at the time when most people are thinking about spending a lot more time going on vacation, being on vacation and spending time with family. Well, Carol decided to continue on, but he kind of had me in tow behind him just so I could have his back. And, you know, I would say that many times when they were like, Carol wants you to do this. Okay, let him know I've got his back. You know, I was always there for him. So what's it like to show up on, we'll call it your first day on Sesame Street, knowing that for for the time being, you're going to be doing right hands and such and learning the monitor skills, but also having the back in your head, like, I'm on the road to becoming Big Bird. Like, how, how do those two things kind of, how do you process those, those two sort of differing um, concepts? Yeah, it's, it's a weird experience because I was aware 
that I would need to get good at the monitor. I would need to get really good at this uh, method. And Kevin Clash, the puppet captain at the time, would a lot of times, he would pair me with David Rudman and be David Rudman's right hand. Um, David Rudman plays Baby Bear. And at the time, that was, he, that was the main character that he played. He did not play Cookie Monster yet. So I did a ton of, of right hands for David. And then I would do a lot of right hands for Jerry as well with the Count and Harry and whoever he was doing. And, and just getting to observe those performers as well as the other guys on, on set was a remarkable education. And I knew, you know, it's, it is a very different thing also just being on the floor and being able to see around you, being able to see the people next to you, or, you know, when you've got your arm up in the air and you're looking at the monitor on the floor, there's a person here, there's a person there. I know exactly where the landscape is around me, but now put a giant yellow bird on yourself and the monitor is strapped to you and is moving with you. It's a very different world. It's very disorienting yeah. and isolating <laughs> at the same time. Another thing it makes me think about is like whenever someone is like newer at a job, you're always are you afraid to make a mistake, a mistake or something, right? And you always, even though it might not be true, like oh, if I mess this up, they might fire me, you know. And there's a lot to lose, you know, for anyone in the, in any position. But in that position, like there's there's in the back of your head maybe an anxiety that you have even more to potentially use being being so new and knowing what the future could hold. What did you feel like there was extra pressure on you? Was that ever a, a weight for you at all? No, I don't know why. I think I was just stupid. Um, <laughs> I wasn't. I was just so thrilled to be there and to be a yeah. part of it. And, um, and here's the other side of it, is that I came in at the same time as John Tertaglia came in. Mm -hmm. And John was, and he still is, younger than me. And uh, when we came in, I was um, 20... How old was 26, 27, and John was not. He was much younger, and um, he was so wide-eyed and just enthusiasm beyond control. Uh, he was just everywhere. He was just like a like a crazy little bouncing kitten everywhere. He was in everything, <laughs> and he was it you know looking back now it was extremely and it's ex it's extremely endearing but at the time he was the target of a lot of uh hazing i'll call it you know uh it, because it's, it's part of the muppet life that you're going to be made fun of it's it's gentle ribbing but it's also can be soul crushing <laughs> so it's like bro brotherly love type of a thing right? it's brotherly that, love yeah, but yes yeah. it, but it can also make you know i don't i don't know if john was ever <laughs> brought to tears <laughs> but if it had it been me i i don't know if i would have been able to hold up he's you know super resilient yeah. uh but because we came in at the same time he caught the brunt of that <laughs> and i just kind of came in and did Skated my thing. Paid it. Flew under the I, radar. <laughs> I did. I flew under the radar. So I need to talk to John about that sometime. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, he's obviously extremely successful in this career and, and he's amazing. And and I would think I would think that any of that brotherly love uh, hazing times only made him more uh, made him stronger, made him more resilient, I would think. Yeah, but absolutely. we try not to do that as much now on Sesame Street. It's a little, um, you know, it's it just it was how it used to be, and that's just oh, yeah. not really my my cup of tea. I don't love. I don't love. I think there's there's a, even more gentle ribbing on our on our set than than yeah. probably there was. When and, I was and I imagine too, out. it's more so something now that uh, you know that builds up over time because once you work with people for a long time you truly become a family yes. and then that kind of a thing is is easily seen by everyone as as just as play as play yes yeah that's true and you know we definitely give each other a hard time um especially on the the disney muppet side of it we will give each other 
a really hard time. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's all in good fun. But yeah, it's it can be brutal sometimes. You know, that's something I've I've tried asking this in previous interviews and have not always described or asked the question the, the right way. But I have to imagine, and you've spent so much time with both the the Muppet Show Muppets and and the Sesame Street, that those two environments have to be different. Um, it, I mean, if only from the sense of like institutional memory of like all the camera people are the same and so many of the sound technicians are the same and and there's so much history on on the street um it what what's that you know i don't know if you would call it code shift or because you're you're with most of the same people but how does that change um other than some light ribbing uh when you head over to the muppet show side of things well with with the classic muppet characters um as of late, we kind of have a crew that has been working with us quite a bit. Oh, okay. Oh, sure. Because of Soapbox, probably. Well, yeah, we'll have Soapbox, the Soapbox production company, and then we'll have, you know, a lot of times the same DP, Craig Keefe, and and, um, he has a team. And, uh, but there was a time uh, when that wasn't the case. So going into the 2011 movie, that was, you know, a big, big, big budget film, totally new crew, new producers, nobody knew or had ever shot anything with us ever at all, which was, you know, new and different. And uh, there was a bit of a learning curve. With this kind of job that we do, there is that learning curve. You know, you if you've never shot puppets before, you may not understand that I got to see what you're shooting. I have to see it. Nah, you don't have to see it. No, I really do. I have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do this Unless, next shot blindfolded. If you do you, yeah. the, the next you shot blindfolded. <laughs> turn, you know, turn the viewfinder down, and you know, we'll try it that way. Um, but there's a learning curve, and and until you're in it with somebody new that's learning, uh, you can talk about it until you're blue in the face. But until you're really on the floor and really working the scene, it it's you know, it's new information. Absolutely. But I mean, that's that's really great to hear, um, you know, in in understanding how that that production process works. And it it just makes everything easier, I would imagine, just knowing that, like, OK, thank goodness today I don't have to explain why we need some extra Apple boxes on on standby or, you know, extra monitors or yeah. or any of those things um, and allows you guys to just focus on doing the work, the the real work of you know, channeling the characters and, and doing all those things. Um, yes, that's true. You know, when we get into those situations and we try to troubleshoot as much as we can in production meetings, but even in our production meetings for Sesame Street, where everybody has been doing everything all the time for years, you'll make the best plan and then get to the set and you're like, oh yeah, that's not going to work. We got to come up with something <laughs> right now because we got to shoot this in five minutes. Right. Go. Yeah. You know, and that's some of the brilliance of having the Wranglers that we have, uh, Lara McLean and Michelle Hickey, to name a few. I mean, our, those are our kind of our head Wranglers on Sesame Street. And they just they're so good at what they do. And you throw any problem at them and they can just turn it around just like that and and solve a problem, which is really great about having a team that knows what they're doing and isn't just learning it in that moment. Absolutely. No, that's that's the vital kind of stuff that, um, yeah, they're like the pit crew. Like, they just keep everybody on, on track. Yeah. That's great. But even, like, when, when you're working on Sesame Street, you know, a lot of those people who, who work there are, are very used to the play that you guys tend to do. And, uh, and like, for, for when you were on the set with the 2011 Muppets, like, was there just less of that play because, like, the crew wouldn't, mm-hmm. would see it as just wasting time or something or... No, I think we do that just, it's just inherent in us. We just do it. We'll play, Uh, you know, and it's also a way to kind of get the crew on your side, Yeah. you know, get them to turn into a kid for a minute, just to kind of live in that moment, that space that we're trying to live in, which is playfulness and laughter and having fun. And sometimes it works, and sometimes you can see the biggest, burliest, you know, <laughs> union guy there soften and smile, and, you know, you've got him, and it's great. Yeah. 
That's amazing. Oh, that's so good. So um, around, I think, 2008 or so was when you sort of began taking on some of Jerry's characters. Did that happen across the board with both the Sesame Muppets and the, the Disney Muppets? No. So with Sesame Street, there was never, uh, you know, I was, I was Jerry's right hand for years. And when Jerry became too, he, he was ill and he couldn't put his arms above his head anymore, really, without discomfort. And so he would sit right off to the side. And I have a specific picture in my head of a particular episode <laughs> of literally he's like 10 feet from me. I'm wearing headphones like I have in now. And he is uh, he'll he did the lines live and I had the count on above my head and I was puppeteering live to his lines, which usually and I'm pretty good at it. If you pre-record the lines, you know, it's easy because you can hear it eight or nine times and then you can do it. But. He was sitting there, sitting there live and responding live, like we'd like to do. You know, you want it to feel the most organic as it can, be the most organic performance possible. And so he would sit over there and he would deliver those lines with the same gusto that he had if he had been under the puppet, it's just that he wouldn't, been, wouldn't have been able to do it uh, in his physical state. And so, but that didn't happen with Sesame Street when when... When Jerry died, that's when that character, it was decided that I would carry on in, in that role. Oh, I uh, see. But with the, with the classic Muppets, what happened was, um, with, the, with the classic Muppets, Jerry decided that he didn't want to travel anymore. Uh, because being, doing, working with those Muppets, you'd have to go to L.A. a lot of the times. And so he just didn't really want to do that anymore. And so there was a meeting in a hotel in New York City with Jerry and me and Steve Whitmire and David Rudman and Debbie McClellan, who was uh, in charge of the Muppet Studio at the time. And the goal was to try to find somebody that would take on Richard Hunt's characters, Janice and Scooter, and uh, and then somebody that would take on Jerry's characters. And at the time, it was really just Floyd and uh, Robin. And maybe Dr. Julius Strangebork. Not sure why, because <laughs> there wasn't really anything going on with him. He them. had to but show sir. up in the Bohemian Rhapsody video. So. <laughs> but, but for sure, it was, uh, it was uh, Robin and Floyd. And so, and this was Steve's idea. Steve wanted to have... Uh, as I understand it, Steve really felt that it was time to have a singular person play those roles for for those performers, for Jerry and for Richard. And so we sat in a room with Jerry one evening, and he just talked about it, what he thought of the characters and where 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 his inspirations were, and and he talked about his memories of Richard, and and then he put on the puppets and he kind of showed us how he talked with them and kind of did little things with them and. And then he said, okay, here, you put it on, and, you know, uh, which that did feel intimidating. And, uh, and then that's kind of how that happened. From there, I then did this thing called Studio DC. Hmm. That was my first thing where I was Floyd. And then we did this special called Letters to Santa, hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I was playing Floyd. And there was a moment in it that... New Zealand had a line, and Bill Beretta was playing New Zealand uh, until that moment, and he came up to me and he goes, "Here you go," and I was like, "No, no, no, you play, you play this," and he goes, "No, you you do Jerry characters. This is you go." And they had a line, and I had to go, uh, "Okay, let me figure out what the." <laughs> I'd never done New Zealand before, and then that was the line that I they ended up saying in that movie, and then I became. New Zealand for from then on and and then I guess it was uh, pr assumed that then I played all of those Jerry characters wow. but that's kind of how that happened there was a little meeting in a hotel room for a couple of characters flash forward to 
<laughs> letters to Santa, and now I'm also playing Lou. No, that's fascinating. Um, and so uh, you you obviously had the benefit of Jerry still being around for a time. Would you ever do check-ins with him and say, you know, I'm doing Lou now, and, you know, I'd, I get why they're fish, but I don't know why they're boomerang. Or, like, anything, like... <laughs> idiosyncrasies or anything like that that you wanted him to like add some more shading to that you only had a a 2d understanding of no not not really and and i got because usually it was stuff that happened would happen on the set and for that uh dave goals would come to me and at first he'd be like you've got to be louder floyd's loud you got to be louder you're being too soft and i was like okay great i'll be louder and, you know, he would come up and say little things like that. And, and so he was kind of my, the guy that I would go to or more often would come to me and say, try this, do, do that a little bit more. And the only thing I do remember other than that meeting in the hotel room was somewhere around probably the, the 2011 movie and they were going to put Uncle Deadly in it. Um, I remember Jerry, I feel like I may have reached out to Jerry to say like, there's not a lot out there on uncle deadly. (laughs) What can you tell me about him? And he said, you know, I always thought of him as uh, Jerry would, would pick somebody in radio. A lot of times a radio voice or an actor's voice. And he would use like WC fields for, for Mumford or, uh, for Uncle Deadly, there was an actor named John Carradine, and he had one of those large voices, very big voices, you know. And so that was his inspiration for Uncle Deadly, and it was that was kind of what he was doing, and that was all he gave me. <laughs> That's about it. But, but I had a lot of license to do something with that character uh, in in that movie, and then it's certainly grown since then. But what a, a wonderful opportunity to not only like carry the torch for Jerry, but really show how you could evolve that character and make it be mm-hmm. something where you're not constantly thinking about like, how would he do it? Is this right? Is this like, you could really add your own, um, you know, follow yeah. your own instincts with it. That's true. And you know, to be honest, there's only a certain amount of time that you can think, you know, how would, how would he have done it? How would we have, how would he have done this? You know, there, there comes a, you certainly lean on that heavily at, at the beginning, I would say, for any character that you end up having to take on. And you want to try to have the, the flavor of uh, the feel of, for me, it's like the music of the voice. What mm. does the voice sound like? And um, musically. But there also comes a time when you have to kind of let that go and trust that you're there or or close enough or, you know, in the ballpark that it's going to be there. And then now you have to make choices for the character, for the sake of the character, rather than letting it languish by being in imitation, because being in imitation will not let the character grow. It will not let it evolve. It will not, it will feel stale after a while. Um, but trying to live in the moment with that character and really treat it like a real character with wants and needs and how that character is going to react in that situation, in my estimation, that's how it will grow and, and evolve. And it certainly happened with, with Deadly. We were, I was also given really great writing to work with, especially when we got to the ABC series, there was some really good writing for him, yeah. you know? He, he, in my opinion, was like really the breakout character of that, oh. that show. And we, we talked with Tim Legassi about it, about how he would practically fight people to be able to be your, uh, your right hand on that. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, because he just has such, I mean, you can do whatever. Sometimes I would give the performer like both hands and say, just do something. And they would just, you know, it's just the more, I don't want to say flamboyant, but the more lavish people mm-hmm. could be with the hands, yeah. it's better. You know, something else I'm I'm thinking of is you're describing the sort of independence that you were able to to stake from, um, you know, inheriting Jerry's characters. Did that? How does that contrast then with Big Bird, who you were, you know, understudying Carol for almost 25 years? Like, how do mm-hmm. how do those two things? Um, stack up against each other you know it's it's 
it's still a, it's still the same. There still mm-hmm. needs to be growth in the character. There still needs to be an evolution. It's it, it and the only thing that's really different about it is that there was so much Big Bird and there's so much reference material to to draw from, which is great. And that's very helpful to me because to me, if I keep in my head that this is a six-year-old kid and a six-year-old innocent curious kid, that that's all I that's all I really need for him. I have a tendency to kind of be a bit of, um, especially when I've got a puppet on my hand, to be a bit of a smart aleck from time to time. And there was a little while in there where, you know, and this is just even off off camera, not never on camera, but just off like between scenes. And I found myself doing that with Big Bird uh, every once in a while. And... And I caught myself and I thought, no, I, I have to, I really need to try to remain true to who he is, even when we're not rolling camera. And he'll, he'll still say things that might be, could be perceived as maybe a little smart alecky, but they're really now, when I say them, they are through a, a very innocent lens rather than Matt's, you know, almost 50 year old lens <laughs> saying <Yeah>. something. <laughs> so it, but really, basically, they're the same. It's just keeping trying to keep the objective and the integrity and the soul of the character pure based on the original performer. Sure. I guess the reason I asked that was I wasn't sure if it was, I don't want to say difficult is absolutely the wrong word, but having, you know, Carol perform him one day and then you come in and play him, you know, other times, whether on green screen or, you know, just when you're tapping, tapping in for him. I didn't know if that made it at all, um, if that was a challenge in any way. Well, uh, you know, I, maybe you're referring, you could be referring to Journey to Ernie, which is, was certainly to me started to feel like a s- separate incarnation of Big Bird mm. and not in a great way, really. And, and I, I kind of am not super happy that we did that but what ended up happening was we shot these segments called journey to ernie and they were it's a little game it was all on blue screen and and yeah i don't remember how old carol would have been at the time (laughs) but Uh, he would have been you know not you know no spring chicken yeah and and it would have been it would have been very difficult for him to do all of the things that were required of him on blue screen. And, uh, and the thought I think originally was, oh, maybe Carol will go in and loop it. But there was just so much, there was so much material to loop that it would have been really hard to do. And so I think they, they made the decision, the producers made the decision of, okay, we're just going to have this other version of Big Bird. And what that did for me, in my opinion, is for a while that kind of, it, it split Big Bird into two, into Carol, the real version of Big Bird, and then into this other version. And that's tricky because they, you can water down the character because it's Carol, even if I'm trying to do as much as I can do, like Carol's doing it, and be as true to that as possible, there's still going to be moments or breaths or choices that I make that he wouldn't have made, and it it waters them down. So I wouldn't, I would fight against that happening ever again for any other character. Sure. It just, it's, it's, it could be detrimental to the character. Yeah. Well, and I suppose, and, you know, it's, almost at least you have that as a test case now moving mm-hmm. forward to be able to say okay we we made that mistake yep. it's in the See past that? that now. didn't work and, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah time to move on yeah 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 exactly yeah one thing i'm wondering is uh you know when you were earlier starting in sesame street one thing we've heard about some of the other performers is that you know it's very much a, a gig uh, it, it only films for a couple months out of this, the year did you have another job while you were starting as well at first I did because I wasn't on every day. And uh, so I had a couple different jobs. I, I moved to New York and I got a job at a pet food delivery s- store that was on 80, 81st, and, uh, 81st in Amsterdam. 
And uh, then I got a job as the executive assistant to the dean, to the assistant dean of the business school at Fordham University in the Lincoln Center campus. And I was her, uh, you know, assistant, executive assistant. I would type letters up and answer phone calls and pretend I knew things about business. <laughs> and uh, I did that for a while until it really just didn't, it, I was too busy with Sesame. And so I was very lucky. And um, because it wasn't too long after that, I, that it, the work at Sesame just was too much. We used to shoot a lot more shows than we do now. Yeah. Right. And we're working a lot more months out of the year than we are yeah. now. No, I think that's really important for people to hear because so many people just have another picture in their head, I think, usually when they think of that type of thing. But uh, but also, I did look through your IMDb, too, and I saw that you were did a, you were in uh, an extra, I think, in John Q. In what? In John Q? John Q? Is I that, don't know what that is. You don't, I don't know what that is? It was a movie in, uh, like, 2002, I think? Mm, I wasn't an extra in John Q. <gasps> oh, it's on your IMDb. No, I was not. I was not. <laughs> I was not. Not in John Q. We'll we'll contact IMDb right away. Well, yeah, you let's get them it, on. If you haven't seen it, it's a good movie, Matt. Check it out. Is it? Yeah, I, I you know I didn't even know, but then I saw the the poster there with Denzel Washington. I thought, oh, well, it's got to that got got to be good. Yeah. Yes, I was totally in that movie yes. as an Take uncredited extra. No. <laughs> Sorry. No, uh, but actually, one thing I did want to talk about uh, as well is is uh, you as as a director, and I yeah. think it's always I'm always interested in talking to direct directors because you know I've done a little bit of direction, camera has too, and one thing I know in a lot of directors I've talked to is it can kind of be a very different job depending on you know, like what companies you're working for and or you know the the type of scale of the project because sometimes the directors have a whole bunch of control and sometimes they're just kind of more facilitating things and I was wondering like what exactly is it like to to direct something on Sesame Street Well I have a bit of an advantage to be honest, because all the people that I'm directing are my friends, you know, and I'm one of them. And so I know the challenges that they're going to come up against in any given shot. And I can troubleshoot that ahead of time for them. That's not to say that I don't come up with some crazy idea and that I'm like, but I'm sure we can do it. And then we get there and I'm like, we can't do it. Yeah. But I have a distinct advantage, I feel like, from watching years of street stories directed by really great directors, Emily Squires, Lisa Simon, Ted May, all of these directors from back in the day, uh, Ken Diego and uh, Kevin Clash and Joey Mazzarino and Jim Martin. And these guys knew how to tell the story in this three camera world, which is essential. And especially on Sesame Street, where it's a show where you're also teaching. So you're telling a story and you're teaching. So there are certain things that you want to be able to see. And, uh, you know, you got to have a close up of something if you're talking about it, or you got to at least see it in the shot when they're saying, hey, look at that door. You know, I'm, I'm, I was at an advantage watching those things, especially when I was right-handing, watching and watching how they would do it and seeing, oh, wow, you know what? They're, they're playing this comedy bit on a two-shot. That looks pretty good because it's not just about what the one guy says that's funny. It's about what the other guy, how they react. Yeah. And comedy a lot of times works better, you know, in the wide so that you can see the reactions. And I learned that on Sesame Street. And I learned how to tell the story by watching just endless amounts of street stories being in them and watching them and watching them go, that close-up doesn't work. Uh, and uh, not, sometimes it was the director that would say, that close-up doesn't work, I cut it. Or sometimes it would be the performer saying, I, I don't think I need that close-up. Yeah. Or, can I get a close-up for this line? It's just gonna help me. And our collaboration on Sesame Street is so strong and so, so respectful that that there that kind of communication can happen that kind of discussion can be had and we can say you know I can feel free to say you know what I really need you to do that in the close up because yeah. 
this is why and give them a reason why. And then usually they'll go, yeah, I still don't want it. No, <laughs> they'll say, yeah, wait, can I? Okay, I get it. Uh, but I got most of that experience. Well, all of that, all of that experience I got by watching Sesame Street and observing. And I think yeah. that anything would be the same thing would be true for anybody, you know, who wants to do this, watch movies, watch video, watch whatever it is. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's yeah. so great. And I like seeing that there are puppeteers that are directors because it kind of goes back to how it started too, where Jim and Frank Oz would, uh, direct some of their productions as well. And it's nice that to see that that uh, still happens. And I hope yeah. it continues to happen. And ev even in movies, too, that would be that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love it. You know, I'd love to, I'd love to see more of our performers uh, step up and do some directing. You know, there, there are a lot of them that, that I feel like, I mean, just like me, they've they've had endless hours of watching how it's done. And and the other thing is, you know, they've got a they've got a safety net. None of us are going to let them fail. Of course, right. we all want our fellow performers, or anybody that's directing for that matter. We all want the show to be the best it can be. And so that's what we're all trying to do is trying to make the best show. Whoever's directing, whoever's whoever's in charge. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so we, we can't not talk about. Um, the fact that uh, a couple of years ago you um, took over performing for for Kermit, um, yeah, and um, I guess can can you share what um, how you heard that you were even going to be considered for an audition? Sure. So, you know, Steve Whitmire and the Muppet Studio they parted ways, and that left the role of Kermit and and not only Kermit, but several other characters that Steve either originated or he, or he took on uh, without a performer. And obviously Kermit is the, the, that key character and, and a big character to fill. And there was an audition process that I was a part of that was overseen by the Muppet Studio and by Brian Henson from the Jim Henson Company. And those auditions, I don't remember, I don't know how many people, 20 people, 20 people maybe, uh, those were... Those auditions led to callbacks, and those callbacks led to a series of workshops with Brian in L.A. And at that point, there were four performers that were working um, on the directive of making their version of Kermit to push more toward Jim Henson's version of the character. That was the, that was the goal. And at the end of the workshop, I was chosen by the Muppet Studio to be Kermit. You know, it's not just a character that was just given to me or, or no, grandfather no. to me <laughs> like course, other characters. Course. There was an actual legitimate process where, uh, you know, it was it was a whittled down and there were four really great guys. And I I drew the lucky straw, you know, and I realized that there's a whole generation of people whose Kermit is Steve Whitmire. And I get it. And, and that is OK. You know, I do not hold anything against them. Yeah. But. My job is to do the best that I can do with my version of Jim Henson's version of Kermit the Frog. And that was the directive. And that's what I'm, you know, doing and trying to do and still working on. And, you know, just like I'd say, I'm still working on Big Bird. I've been doing yeah. that for 20 some years. Oh. You know, it's a process and it's, um, you know, my Kermit was Jim. My Big Bird was Carol. My count was Jerry. And, uh, now there is a whole generation of kids whose count is actually me. Just like so many um, see Eric Jacobson as their Grover or their Miss Piggy now. And soon my Big Bird and, and my Kermit will be that version that people know. But each of these incarnations or any incarnation of, of a character that's carried on by another performer, they're all authentic. Oh, absolutely. Each one is unique to that particular performer whoever it is, while still aiming, we all have that same goal of aiming to be true to the original performance, the, the performance that we're, that we all grew up with probably. So that's, that's, that's pretty much what I have to say. I think about Kermit, you know, he's, like I said, Jim was, that was my Kermit. And, uh, yeah. and that's what I try to, that's what I try to hear in my head. I try to hear the music of Jim's voice in my head and um 
you know, it's it's uh, it's a challenge for sure, yeah. um, just as any character is. Um, but it's it's been a it's been a so such a fun ride, and um, it's not something that I I take lightly. I don't take the responsibility lightly, but I also don't think about that responsibility when I'm in it and when I've got my arm up in the air with a frog yeah. on my hand. Oh, you, you can't. Know, that, yeah, no, no. <laughs> right, right. You know, I'm right. thinking about what what's the objective of this scene? How, what do I need to do here? How am I going to get RuPaul to answer this question? That's, you know, <laughs> that was one of my favorites. I'm so, <laughs> so good. I'm a humongous RuPaul's Drag Race fan. So when I saw yeah. it, I could, it was, it was one of my favorite skits, but you know, but just going, off, going off of that too, though, one thing I just, I've always wondered is about in, in kind of preparing for that role physically. One yeah. thing I've noticed is like, like your work with uncle deadly and of course, Constantine, you know, and, cause it is a different type of puppet in a way. Do you feel yeah. like, those two characters performing them in any way helped you a little bit with um, preparing with this, or maybe it's a, it's a nuanced difference really, but you know, a lot of puppets do kind of move and, and operate differently inside the head. That is true. And when I was doing Constantine, so inside Kermit's head, there's really not, there's nothing in there, yeah. just your hand. Yeah. And my hand is smaller than Jim hand, Jim's hand was for sure. Uh, and, and Steve's as well. My hand is smaller. So I have a lot more room in there to try to fill out with my hand. So my hand isn't in there like this. It's in there like this. And that's yeah. kind of what, you know, that's how Steve had his hand inside as well, uh, to try to fill out the head. Uh, in Constantine, there I had put in, uh, I had a, a little piece of uh, L200 or something put in there so that my finger could rest on the top of it and I could do, I could make him do other things because his his face was so. I did yeah. a lot of stuff with his face, like way more than what I do with Kermit. I kind of, I'm trying to push my Kermit to be like to feel and or to look, you know, and feel like what Jim's was, which had a very kind of sidey side head movement and um, not sing, every single syllable all the time. But Constantine was like every single syllable and just little tiny little movements and because the word the way he spoke was just so ridiculous that it just calls for seeing the mouth be pliable and move. And similarly to Deadly, where I feel like I mean he's just this great, such a great puppet, so light and he just moves. Anything my hand does inside the head you can see it. I mean, just small little movements, tiny little movements. You can see in that foam, just a piece of foam. And I don't know if they inform how I do Kermit because with Constantine, he was just a totally original character. So I could do pretty much anything I wanted. I don't think Jerry really did a lot or enough with uncle deadly to get to the point where he would have done anything, you know, flourishy or, or to, move the malleable mouth around. Um, but I've kind of been given license to do that. Um, yeah. no, that's so just so interesting to hear just because obviously like a puppet like Big Bird or The Count, you know, there, you don't have to, that's a level of manipulation you don't have to think about. Although, yeah. I'm, although I'm sure each puppet has their own types of nuances yeah. in performing them. Yes, with, with Big Bird, it's about the eyes for me because yeah. he's very stiff. His, his beak is everything's very stiff in Big Bird. So it's the eyes that I try to work a lot with. And that's just my pinky inside moving around the eyes. And then with the count, I, my goal is to try to, and with uh, Fat Blue or Mr. Johnson as well, my goal is to try to replicate something that Jerry did, something Jerry did when, when he moved, with, especially with Fat Blue, Mr. Johnson, is he did a lot of moving, like, just like side to side, just like constant <laughs> moving or moving this way and that way. So I do that with him, and with the count, I try not to hit every single syllable, because Jerry wasn't a, a, a sing, every single syllable uh, performer, and so I try to replicate that a little bit. Yeah, It's like an enhanced version of it, but but yeah, those are stiffer characters, certainly the Count and Big Bird, and there are different things that you have to do to kind of make them sing. And uh, with Mr. Johnson, he's a little bit more pliable, so I have had times where I've like really shoved his lower jaw back into his skull, which is fun. Yeah, that's you so know. cool. Um, one other thing that I, um, just in terms of being able to find yourself in Jim's Kermit, so to speak, um, I have to imagine that you got some 
it, it had to be really wonderful to do the live Muppet shows um, to kind of feel like, oh, this was this was Kermit stomping ground. And I'm yeah. I'm here as him. Can you talk about that? Experience? Yeah, that was the first. So the Muppets take the bowl was the was my public debut as Kermit the Frog. I mean, in front of 18,000 people. No pressure. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was a little nervous about that, but it was a kind of an exciting, you know, I had I had all my brothers and sister puppeteers, Muppet performers around me, you know, and they were all there for me, supporting me. And um, it was a blast. It was so much fun. And the, the love from the audience was palpable. You could just, it just hit us like a, like a like a brick, but in a good way. Um, a good brick, a soft and it brick. was, yeah, um, it was a great experience. And yeah, it does feel like that's. I mean, that's just what those characters are made for. The characters are made to be in this show. They're this repertory company that does this, you know, comedic musical variety show. That's what they're made for, and that's where they work the best. And, and I imagine uh, being uh, in a live performance was probably a really good first place to do it for you because I, I, I could imagine, just knowing myself as a performer, like the fact of you uh, that you would have been able to do another take if it was a film thing. You may have been overly critical on yourself, but just being able to, you know, like, you know what? Here we go, guys. And then it's just, you know, there, in, in a yeah. way, even though there's a lot of pressure because it's live, there's no pressure because, like, what it is is what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we, of course, had rehearsed yeah. quite a bit. I think the thing that was pretty cool about that particular show was that, you know, the closer you sat to the stage, whether we were at the Hollywood Bowl or at the O2 in London, the closer you sat to the stage, you could choose which show you wanted to watch. Did you want to watch the big mag, mag screens and see the, the puppet show and see the Muppet show? Or did you want to look at the stage and see the puppets and the puppeteers underneath and how they did what they did, which, which is kind of unique for, for this. We weren't masked probably... 80% of the show, we weren't masked. You know, the Electric Mayhem, we were inside a stage, inside a little little blinder kind of rock and roll stage. And for Pigs in Space, we were hidden. But almost everything else, we were in full view of the audience, which is, you know, a little vulnerable if you're, you know, us who, you know, yeah. we are used to being not seen. <laughs> and we're fine with that. We are fine with being not seen. So... Um, the experience was, I think, unique for, for audiences, and I hope we get to do some more of that kind of thing because it, it was fun, and it's really where I feel like the characters do so well. Yeah, I, it it sounded like a wonderful show. Adam and I weren't able to, to get there, but we had a number of friends who were, uh, well, both on stage and <laughs> in the audience, but um, <laughs> no, it, it, it just looked, it, it was truth to form in so many ways like it like you said it's it's what they were made for so you know that's that's where they thrive yeah there's one more thing i was just wondering and uh we're not necessarily wondering is I've, I've been playing uh looking through your youtube channel which has been a real uh uh gem of, of things that i've been able to find there and mm. uh i see some f fun old videos there and uh, one of them that particularly caught my eye was murder he squeaked <laughs> uh, so uh, yes. and, uh, before, you know, one thing I really enjoyed just about seeing a lot of these videos is that it's just like it's like a peek inside of your mind a little bit, I feel like. And just seeing that, like, beyond working on these productions, there's you you have fun with you know, these, some of these characters and puppetry in general enough to have been inspired to create some of these shorts. And I just uh, have, have really been enjoying them. Oh, thank you. You know, that, that, mur that murder he squeaked, winner of the Trenton Film Festival, by the Ooh. way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that was written by uh, Joey Mazzarino and myself. And, uh, and I think it was Joey that had the idea. He's like, let's just do a little short film. Let's do a puppet noir murder film <laughs> where the dog's squeaky toy comes to life and tries to get him to kill his owner's boyfriend because he's jealous <laughs> he's just a jealous dog uh and i was like yeah let's do that so we you know we 
we wrote it and we directed it and then I edited it and and uh, it was fun. It's a silly little movie. I love it. And um, I wrote the music in it and performed the music in it. And uh, yeah, it's a goofy little film that I I, I just love. Yeah. I love it. And it kind of shows you just, it was just two guys having fun seeing what we could do with a video camera and some puppets. And, you know, if we can do it, I'm sure there's a lot of other people out there that can do something similar. Yeah, that's why I always try to encourage people to do, too. Is a, And I think it's inspiring to see that because, you know, so many people just want to work on a project. But, they're, you know, it says something else when you have the drive uh, to, to produce something yourself, even if it is just, you know, in your own house with just you and, and, a, and a friend or two. I think yeah. um, I think that's where you can learn a lot um, if you don't have uh, an opportunity to necessarily jump into a professional experience right away. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, I know this is a podcast about puppetry, but it could be anything. It really can be anything. That's that thing that Jerry Nelson told me. He, he did say to me one night as we were sharing a drink up in his house in Cape Cod, he said, Matt, Sesame Street's great, but you always got to have something that you create that comes from you. Uh, And I've always tried to honor that and keep that true for my life. And that's like one of the questions I ask on Below the Frame, too. I always ask, that's the last question I ask, in fact. I ask them, what's that thing that's yours? You know, and it's fun to hear what people, because they come up with all kinds of different things you know and some of them are like i don't have anything i'm like no you do you do you do have something we all have something that we create what you know it could be gardening it could be you know making jewelry it could be you know just a family reading it could be your family <laughs> reading yeah. vo- reading books and funny voices it doesn't it's you you have something everybody has something yeah and what is that thing for you i don't have anything <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, one thing it does make me think of um, is just like, you know, if, if you if you were if it was a different life and you never found the Muppets and you didn't even do acting, is there something else you think you may have found yourself doing? Well, you know, it's kind of that thing of uh, I don't really I can't do anything. There's not really anything else I'm really that good at. I mean, I have little things that I'm kind of good at this or this over here, but um, hmm. See, it took it away when I when you said if you couldn't do puppetry, then I would have said, well, I probably would have been an actor then. That yeah. would have been what I focused on. But you know, in a lot of ways, I see that that is what I do. Is I'm yeah. an actor. I just have, yeah. and I'm an actor from here up. Um, I I don't know. I feel like I would have something. It would have something to do with film or editing or directing. Yeah. I think I'd still be in this in this world somehow, directing theater maybe, or I don't know. But it would probably be something like that. Yeah. It's, it's a funny question, right? Because like, to ask something ultimately like that, like, what would you do if you weren't an artist? It's like, well, yeah. what would I have done if I hadn't stubbed my toe when I was in, <laughs> in third grade? Like, it's that ripple effect, right? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. But also, we, we had some interesting at, uh, um, Oh, for sure. Too. Just thinking of like Rick, Lazzarina, sure. Rick Lazzarini, who does, uh, um, you know, special effects, um, building of all types of like... Uh, from famous movies. He, like he did Barth's ears in Spaceballs. <laughs> yes, and yes. The uh, alien and, and, and that talking, popped out an alien. And talking to him, he, he said that, you know, like if he wasn't in special effects, he'd probably still be using a lot of those skills, but to make like prosthetics and stuff for people mm-hmm. and, and things like that. So it's interesting to see how so many people think they could maybe use their skills in another way. But uh, no, but that's, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what it'd be. I'd probably just be, I just wouldn't be on the performance side. I'd be behind the scenes. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Well, Matt, the last question that we ask on our show uh, is if you have, uh, in the spirit of Mr. Jim Krupa, if you have a good puppeteer story of a sort of a blooper or like a war story of something that didn't go right in the moment that uh, when you're sharing drinks with people that you could kind of laugh at um, and just enjoy and shed a good puppet tear. Yes, I do have something. So... We were shooting a little movie called The Adventures of Elmo in Grouchland. I've heard of it. We shot it in, in <laughs> yeah, we shot it in, in North Carolina. And it was my, I mean, that I, I'd been in a, a movie before, not John Q. But I, <laughs> I'd been in a movie before as a human actor. 
uh, when I was in college. But this was really the first movie that I was a part of. And I was away from my uh, wife and I was in, you know, missing her, but working on this really fun project. And there was a scene in the movie where a bunch of animals were coming through, you know, and I was given a goat to come through the scene. And, and this was also a day that Brian Henson was there. He had on probably like a donkey or something. We were all running through the scene. And I used to chew gum a lot. And we're standing around, and I'm, I've got the puppet on my hand. We're waiting to go on, and I'm chewing gum. And I don't know, we're laughing, I'm sure, because that happens a lot on sets. And uh, I dropped the gum directly onto the goat. And it stuck there. Now, these are not inexpensive. These are, these are even the AM characters, they're, you know, they're worth a, a pretty penny. I, I think I've driven cars that are cheaper than some of the puppets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You so might own this, one too, Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so there's, absolutely there's, true. There's, there's gum on this goat. And there's Brian Henson right over there. And I'm like... What am I gonna do? I don't want. I don't want to grab it and pull it off. I don't know what to, what to do. Well, I called Lara McLean over, our wonderful Wrangler, and I said, Lars, I've got gum on the goat, and she's like, I'll take care of it, and she like. <laughs> Took care of it very quickly. I don't even know what she did. She's a sorceress. She just <laughs> no gum on the goat, at at all. And, you know, I was a little panicked, of course, because, you know, this was relatively early in my career, really. You, there was a lot on the line, like we talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'd always felt pretty confident <laughs> up to that moment. <laughs> I'd always felt I was okay. But then I was like, oh, man, you can't drop gum on a goat. You just can't. You can't do that. And that that's my puppeteer's story. I love Ooh. it. Great. No, when you when you mentioned Brian was there, I thought you were going to say you were performing under him and you dropped it on him. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that would have been good too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, uh, so, what's the best way for people to to follow your work and and reach you? Well, I'm on the socials. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at uh, Welcome Matt V. Welcome Matt, two T's and the letter V. Uh, and um, I'm also, I also have a website. It's called mattvogel.com. It's very original. Uh, I, I don't op- update it that often, but it's there. And there's uh, stuff there to look at if you want to. Um, and that's, that's probably, you know, more turn on Sesame Street. And you have a, a new podcast that people might be able to follow too, huh? <laughs> that's true. The podcast, well, you can get those things from Welcome Matt V oh, on Twitter and Instagram, enough, but enough. also, but then I also, for some reason was like, well, I should have a Instagram for the podcast and a Twitter for the podcast. So now I end up just doing double posts, <laughs> but on Instagram, it's at below the frame and on Twitter, it's just below frame. I don't know why. I put in below the frame, but Twitter said it's below frame. <laughs> so, but that's that's where you can find me. But you know, going to my stuff is where you'll get like everything because sometimes I forget to post on this <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast site. I'm still new at it, so I'm like trying to figure out how to streamline. Sure, sure, sure. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, Matt Vogel, thank you so much uh, for joining us as we do our Cheers to Puppeteers series. It was so great to have you here and. Uh, would love to catch up again some other time. I would do it in a second. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. so much, Matt. Bye. We're at the end of another episode of Puppeteers, but the fun doesn't stop here. Visit puppeteers.com for show notes and links to projects mentioned in this episode. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Puppeteers Pod, where we're posting new things every day. Puppeteers is edited by Matt Bowen and made possible thanks to viewers like you. If you enjoy this content, you can join our incredible Patreon patrons who are supporting the show for as little as $1 per episode. Those folks get access to early releases, uncut episodes, official Cup O tiers just like we use on the show, and can even submit interview questions for our guests. Go to patreon.com slash puppeteerspod to learn more. Another great way to support Puppeteers is rating and reviewing us on iTunes. 
leaving a comment or subscribing to this channel, or tell a friend about your favorite episode. Thanks again for joining us on Puppeteers Puppetry Shop Talk, in-depth interviews with the world's most passionate puppeteers. Hosted by me, Adam Krutinger. And me, Cameron Garrity. What does it say his credit Adam. is, Adam? Um, I think it was just an extra. And again, knowing huh. your acting background, I wasn't surprised to see it. But it, yeah. it was a movie I liked a lot I when, it, when it came out. I just remember. What, what year like, was it? Oh, was it? Was it like 2002, I think? 2002. Okay. John Q. What the hell is that? New Year's Eve party guest. No, I was not in that movie. This is incorrect. Oh, it's wrong. It's incorrect. <laughs> Darn. I thought that this was going to be a nice little right. Easter egg. <laughs> That, that's the I Matt Mogul with the, uh, with the, the with mole Denzel covered Washington up. Movie, yeah, right? I mean, there, pro- there is another Matt Vogel, but, yeah, uh, but that is not me. And it does say uncredited, and I don't know who put that in there. 